Welcome to the Future of Privacy Forum Book Club um, for today, April 24th, 2019. Today we're going to be talking about an awesome book called Habeas Data. We are very fortunate um, to be joined by Sarus Farver, um, who is the author of the book. Um, Sarus, uh, everybody can see you. Can you hear me? I can. How are you doing? Awesome. We're, we're doing great today. Um, I'm also very pleased to be joined um, by two discussants, um, and we also uh, really hope that other folks will raise their hand either, um, you know, in the Zoom app or by typing things into the chat um, and participate in the discussion. But we have two fabulous discussants to help us uh, get started in the interactive portion. I have Sasha Carbone, uh, the Associate General Counsel and Assistant Corporate Secretary of the American Arbitration Association. Um, Sasha, are you there? I am. Hello. Good awesome. to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I also have Camilla Ravazzolo, um, EU Policy Manager of the Market Research Society. Camilla, are you there? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry. I can't make my camera work, but <laughs> I'm trying my best. No problem. We, we know technology is hard. Tech policy is hard. Law and tech is hard. Um, and, and maybe my privacy settings are too hard. <laughs> it, it's certainly possible and totally fine if you just want to participate via audio. So yeah, I'll try in the meanwhile. Sorry again. So I thought we might kick things off um, by uh, you know letting Sarus talk a little bit about the book, which by the way is a fantastic book. Um, I know folks here have read it because you're here at the book club, but please do recommend it to others and candidly. I, I have read Sarus's work online primarily. I did not read um, any of his previous offline stuff. When I started this book, I thought to myself that, um, you know, I know a lot of these stories. I know about the Carpenter case. I know about cash, a little bit about privacy, you know, the law, stuff like that. Um, but I was absolutely blown away by the storytelling in this book. It is absolutely fantastic. It brings these stories to life. It brings the players in these stories to life, I think, more so um, than anything else I've read. And I very much appreciate that. I think when the book kicks off with, um, you know, little known stories about Larry Tribe as a Supreme Court clerk, um, you know, trying to work that uh, decision making process, I think you're, you're in a good spot and, and you're off on a good ride and it doesn't stop there. Right. It just doesn't end there. So um, really love the book, really appreciated all of the work that went into it. Um, and so I thought we might let uh, Saru start off and, and talk a little bit about the book, talk a little bit about why he wrote it, um, and then toss it to our discussion, discussion, Sasha and Camilla, and then um, open it up to everybody. And like I said, um, if you're in the Zoom app, if you're in the browser version of Zoom, you can either raise your hand, there's a raise hand function there. There's also a chat function where you can type in um, uh, uh, text messages and, and we can go ahead and repeat them. Really do want it to be interactive because I think that's the most fun, right? Um, so, Sarus, um, writing a book is hard. Hard for, maybe not for you, for lots of people it's hard, right? It, it um, is hard, I won't argue with that. Okay, so these are super interesting issues, but, but why did you sit down and decide to write a book like Habeas Data? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and first of all, thank you guys for inviting me. I'm, I'm very grateful to, um, literally any person who has made the affirmative choice to sit down and engage with this book. Um, I'm especially grateful to very smart lawyers such as yourself and all the other people listening uh, here. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have been invited to uh, speak to law schools and other groups of lawyers before. And, and truly, I'm humbled because I'm a person who I feel like I'm constantly asking dumb questions of very smart lawyers. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you get something out of this. Um, I wrote this book because, uh, you know, if, if you're familiar, so I recently changed jobs, some of you may know, I, about two months ago, I moved from Ars Technica, where I had been for almost seven years, um, to now a new role where I'm an investigative tech reporter at NBC News. Uh, I'm still in the Bay Area, I'm still covering a lot of the same issues. Um, I probably won't be reporting as much for Ars Technica, I was writing almost every day, sometimes twice a day. Um, five days a week, it was kind of a lot. So, so this job uh, uh, slows things down for me a little bit, which is, which is great. Um, but this book came out of, in many ways, it's kind of a culmination of, I would say, five or six years of my daily reporting at Ars Technica. 
um, you know, I would learn about different kinds of technologies, whether it was license plate readers, whether it was, you know, Edward Snowden, whether it was stingrays, whether it was body cameras or drones, or there's like a whole laundry list of different technologies that now exist and that are now in use uh, in the city where I'm talking to you right now, Oakland, California, where I live, um, but also probably in the cities where you live too. And I think many of us don't understand or don't realize um, how prevalent many of these technologies are and also don't realize, maybe you do because you guys do this for a living, but I think most people don't uh, understand how it is and why it is that these technologies came to become so prevalent and what the laws are that enable these technologies to exist. Um, you know, this book in many ways really got started with my engagement with uh, license plate readers. And I've written a number of stories now over the years about license plate readers. When I first heard like what the idea of a license plate reader was, I was kind of amazed. I was like, okay, so it's like this machine that captures plates at very high speeds, 60, up to 60 plates per second, which is an astonishing speed, right? Far faster than, you know, even, you know, one person, let alone, you know, there's, I think, 40 of us on this call right now. Uh, you know, if all of us, you know, were together and we walked outside on a busy street, we probably couldn't even do 60 plates per second, right? Only a machine could do that. Um, and that's really incredible. And then when I wanted to know, like, well, what is the law that enables these things? What, how is it possible that there's no kind of affirmative law in Oakland or in many other cities that kind of specifically enables this technology? Then I started, you know, asking around and started learning about, you know, these various cases. And in the case of license players, the, the Supreme Court case, as many of you who read the book know, right, was enabled by this wacky story, uh, not. Uh, involving, you know, I compare it to uh, Breaking Bad in Minnesota in the 70s, right? It's this meth gang, and these dudes are driving around, and ultimately the Supreme Court finds that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in public. And that case was decided the year I was born, 1982, right? It was decided at a time when license plate readers, if they existed at all, they existed in kind of a vague academic kind of, re, you know, research way. There were no commercial license plate readers that existed in 1982. And I just found that whole idea kind of incredible that like we have this legal precedent. This is, of course, as you all well know, this is how the law works, right? The Supreme Court or a court decides a thing. And then there are ramifications that come on down the line. But I, but it amazes me that, um, you know, something like that, that was so focused on such a relatively small scale crime. Uh, now, decades later, we're living with the ramifications of you know, police departments uh, in Oakland, small town, you know, uh, uh, cities, uh, big cities like Washington, D.C., and New York, uh, you know, over in the U.K., uh, they use this uh, a lot, right? They call them, they're called automatic number plate readers. They use a slightly different word. Um, and they're in use in many, many cities around the world. And I just found that kind of story, at least here in the United States, of, you know, having that legal history and understanding where that came from to be really fascinating. And then, you know, it's kind of like falling down. I'm sure you, I don't know if this happens to, to a lot of you. You know, I, I find myself falling down these kind of Wikipedia rabbit holes or, you know, the legal equivalent is like legal footnote rabbit holes where like you get, you find, you know, so, you, so I read about the Knotts case. I'm like, okay, I think I, I get what this case is about. And then there's this idea of like, you know, referring back to the, to the, um, to the Katz case and the reasonable expectation of privacy whole idea that we've lived with in this country for a half a century. And then I had to go like, well, what is that case all about? And again, it, it just kind of amazes me that in many of these situations, they're very small time. And I suppose this is true for many Supreme Court cases, is that they're, they're really, uh, you know, very small time stories, right? They're very small time people. It's not in many of these instances having to do with surveillance. Um, they're not, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, I don't know, the ACLU or for what, in most cases, they're not, you know, the ACLU searching for some particular ideal plaintiff or whatever. Uh, it's somebody making a very concerted argument saying, hey, you know, like this is, it should be different here. Uh, and you mentioned Larry Tribe and, uh, you know, and I profile, as you know, Harvey Schneider, the uh, the young lawyer who represented him. And it was funny also to, to learn in the Carpenter case, you mentioned the Carpenter case recently, right? So Nate Wessler, ACLU lawyer, he's slightly older than, than he's about my age, I'm 37. Um, he was like slightly older than Schneider was when he, you know, argued before the Supreme Court. Um, and I just found that fascinating that, that, you know, it might be kind of a generational thing and every generation kind of has to grapple with these issues in kind of a new way. Um, and if you look at the, at the front of the book, one of the things that, that really surprised me over the course of the research of this book is that, you know, these are very old questions, right? These are questions that are, you know, not only have the courts uh, dealt with throughout the decades, um, there's that, you know, if you look at the epigraph in the very beginning of the book, um, right, it talks, there's this line that I love here, I'm just going to grab 
because of course I keep my own book on my on my desk, right? There's this line that I that I just love, um, where you know it talks about uh, it's from a different case that I don't even write about. It. It's by it's by Chief Justice Earl Warren from a case called Lopez versus United States, uh, 1963. And he says, the fantastic advances in the field of electronic communication constitute a great danger to the privacy of the individual, that indiscriminate use of such devices in law enforcement raises grave constitutional questions under the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, and that these considerations impose a heavier responsibility on this court in its supervision of the fairness of procedures in the federal court system. That's before cats. That's before we get to any of this. And I find that amazing. And then the next quote, of course, is from Justice Scalia from 2009, where he says, I just hate Fourth Amendment cases, which is also beautiful. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how, you know, when you really dig into this history, there are moments where people kind of come to the sort of same realization. Um, there's, the, there's, a, there's a case, uh, you know, in the Smith versus Maryland case, um, there's a Maryland appellate court judge um, who talks about, who essentially predicts the Section 215 NSA metadata program, he says, hey, if we got all this data and we plug it into a big computer, uh, we'd have a big problem here. And that was like in the late 70s when he was writing. Um, and I, when I found that, I just thought, wow, you know, there were some people who could see it, who could see what those ramifications would be. Um, so I just find these stories just really endlessly fascinating. And really the book came together because I was reporting all these stories and I had breakfast with an old professor uh, and he was like, oh, this should be your next book is just like telling the story of these cases. And I was like, okay. And so that's how, that's literally, it was as dumb as that, you know, that, that's sort of how it happened. Um, but um, I'm very grateful to, to, um, to you know, hear, hear more from you guys if you have more specific questions. Yeah, for, for sure. So let me start with that epigraph because it's yeah. great. <laughs> I'm it's glad great. you like it. So, but, but can I ask, I know the answer to this question because I watched the video, I watched the interview. Why does Justice Scalia hate Fourth Amendment cases? Why does this, I mean, I think if I remember correctly, I, I, I don't have that specific, because I think he said that if I'm not mistaken during, yeah, as you say, an interview. And I believe it, it has to do with, and you can tell me if this is wrong. I believe it has to do with um, him saying, you know, that Fourth Amendment has so much to do with procedure and like the, the kind of circumstances of the particular thing, um, you know, like, did you cross the property line or not? Did you place the thing on the dude's car or not? Did you, uh, you know, uh, right? It has to do with like the particular facts of the particular thing. And I think he was just kind of throwing up his hands and saying like, this is so weird and hard and difficult um, that uh, I, I think is kind of what he was getting at. But, um, and in many cases, that's, and it's really interesting to read, you know, for example, in the Carpenter case, many of the, the discussions of the different justices, and there are a lot of justices on the court right now that, in my reading, are very frustrated with this whole reasonable expectation of privacy notion. I, I forget which justice off the top of my head, I'm sure you guys remember, um, but I remember in reading one of the dissents, you know, somebody said, like, we shouldn't even have this standard to begin with, like, this is just totally wrong fundamentally. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, and as many of you who follow kind of the academic discussion in legal journals, uh, right, we, we still don't have a clear answer as to what those words mean. What is reasonable or not reasonable? What is an expectation? We, all, we have sort of a vague idea. We have like a decent idea, I think, of what privacy means. But those things mean different things in different contexts. And I think they mean different things to you know, us as individuals, and that changes, right? I, there's the quote from, from Justice Marshall uh, from decades ago, where he said, you know, privacy is not, I'm going to get the words wrong, but, you know, privacy is not discreet, right? It's not on or off. There's, there's, there's levels of gray there. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the things that makes this area of the law so fascinating for me, and I guess for you as well. Nice. Um, so that is, um, th that is a, a great segue, um, and I'm going to toss this to, to Sasha and Camilla in a second, but th that's a great segue um, to this question of, you know, how justices approach these things. And you're, you're right. Um, I, I actually, I, I love the epigraph so much that I actually ran down the quote. And <laughs> he did, did say this in an interview. He said it in the context of um, assignments of opinions, of Supreme mm -hmm. Court opinions, where the chief, in this case, it was under uh, Justice Rehnquist, Chief Rehnquist, mm -hmm. um, would assign opinions and uh, Justice Rehnquist would assign opinions to various justices. Mm -hmm. And um, he would try to be very equitable and ensure that all of the justices got some, what he thought of as plum opinions, mm -hmm. really, that they would really love. Mm -hmm. 
every justice would also get some opinions that were kind of ministerial or uninteresting and that the burden of writing those ministerial opinions would also be spread equally, right? And he thought it was very important to the work of the court to do that. Right. And Lee was making the point that, that sometimes his assessment of what was a plum opinion did not comport with that of the chief. <laughs> and Justice Lundquist loved Fourth Amendment cases. Right. And so when he would assign one to Justice Scalia, Scalia would say, he thought he was giving me a plum opinion, but I hate Fourth Amendment cases for exactly the reason you say. He thought that they were very fact specific. Right. In, in many times they hinged on um, idiosyncratic fact scenarios right. and unusual fact scenarios. And, and perhaps, as you say, not the most important fact patterns, but simply the ones that through the criminal procedure process made it all the way to the Supreme right. Court. Right. Um, and I'm going to come back, that's a thread I'm going to pull on later. But, <laughs> but let me, let me um, toss this. Sasha, um, questions or comments for Saruz? Okay, here we go. I'm not on mute anymore. Um, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I found the book fascinating. Um, it's really it was difficult to put down. Uh, one of the things that struck me when reading the book was the haphazard way in which these cases came to the Supreme Court. Um, the lawyers in these cases, for the most part, didn't select the cases. And certainly the facts were uh, facts that they had to work with. Um, so I think one of the conclusions that you reached in the, the book was that courts are perhaps um, not the best forum to address these privacy issues. Um, they're ineffective, inadequate, inadequate, and perhaps incomplete uh, forums. And you mentioned um, um, an effort uh, in your hometown in Oakland, uh, and specifically these advisory committees uh, that meet and work with city agencies to um, evaluate the use of technology. And so my question is, um, in doing your research, why hasn't this method taken off? Um, why hasn't it taken root in other jurisdictions? It seems to make complete sense uh, that this would be um, uh, something that would be duplicated or seen as a model. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I think you raise a really great point. And it's something that I don't know the answer to, to be honest. Um, I know that there have been efforts to do, um, right, so o what Oakland's doing, if you guys remember from, from the end of the book, um, right, so Oakland is doing kind of two things. One, we have this Privacy Advisory Commission, which as far as I know, there are no other cities in America that have something like this. And if you're interested in what we're doing here in Oakland, you can actually go to the, uh, I can put the link once I find it later, we can send it out. Um, but you can actually subscribe. You don't have to live in Oakland. You can subscribe to the email, you know, minutes and agenda and documents and disclosures that they send out for these meetings all the time. So if you guys just want to know like what's happening, all you have to do is just punch in your email and you can subscribe and you get the same emails that I do. Um, uh, and if you're in town on the particular Thursdays when they have the meetings, you can come to them. They're public, boring, you know, Brown Act, uh, you know, transparent, open meetings. Um, so um, I think that, that, that it's really uh, in many ways kind of an accident that it happened here as opposed to New York City or Chicago or Wichita or Orlando or wherever. Um, you know, as I describe in the book, right, we, we had this moment in 2013 where um, a lot of people were very agitated in the wake of Edward Snowden and were looking to understand not only what the federal government was doing, but what was happening in our own cities and our own communities. And, uh, you know, this was the, actually the very first city council, open city council meeting that I ever went to was the meeting where they approved uh, this thing called the Domain Awareness Center. This was, I think, supposed to be a very boring, run of the mill, rubber stamp, uh, accepting of these federal funds. What it turned out to be was a lot of people packed the chamber, brought signs, were yelling, they voted on this, I think it was 12.30 or one in the morning. I don't know what your city council meetings are like where you live, but the ones that I've been to here often go late, late into the night and people just feel like their voices really aren't heard by the legislators. Um, and so, um, you know, that was a really interesting meeting and it really galvanized a community of privacy-minded people um, here that now operate under the umbrella. If you go to openprivacy.org, that's essentially the outgrowth of this uh, kind of agitation. Uh, and this guy, Brian Hofer, um, who I sort of profile at the end of the book, um, 
as I say, came really close to not, he almost walked out of one of these privacy meetings uh, and was encouraged to stay and was encouraged to meet with city council members to discuss these issues. And that is how the Privacy Advisory Commission got started. Um, I don't think there's anything secret. I, Brian, I know, has been giving talks all over the country uh, about this. Um, I, would, I know he would love to see, and I would love to see, and I think maybe many of you would love to see, uh, this model be replicated in other places. Um, I don't think it's that difficult. I don't think there's any special superpower that we have here. Um, I know that other communities around the Bay Area, I know in Seattle, in Boston, Massachusetts, and maybe some of you can educate me as to what's happening in your communities. I know are considering similar uh, uh, kind of transparency bills that would make uh, law enforcement usually, but other city entities be more forthright and proactive in saying, okay, we want to acquire, you know, drones and body cameras and, you know, X, Y, and Z things, and here's why, and like, here's what we're going to do with them, and we're going to establish ahead of time privacy policy, and that's all well and good. Um, so I think more communities are doing that element, but I haven't seen anybody doing the kind of commission element with the like live meetings and, and stuff. Um, and incidentally, as a footnote to this, um, news about Brian Hofer uh, uh, today out of Oakland is that in federal court, um, he, uh, represented by a local attorney uh, here in Oakland, a guy by the name of Glenn uh, uh, Katon, K-A-O-T-O-N. Um, he's Katon Law on Twitter, I believe. Um, uh, Brian was pulled over by the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department a few months ago um, due to a license plate reader error, which is kind of amazing. Um, he was renting a car through a uh, rental car service called GetAround, which is like one of these peer-to-peer -peer rental car agencies. Um, he was pulled over uh, in driving back. He comes from the far northern parts of California. He was driving back from his home. Uh, I think it was after Thanksgiving late last year um, and was driving back to Oakland. He was stopped in the town of San Pablo, which is a couple towns north from Oakland um, by the deputies. Uh, they pulled him over. Um, they ordered him and his brother out of the car. Uh, the deputy was under the belief that this car had been stolen because his license plate reader told them that, that it was. Um, uh, Brian's brother had a gun pointed to his head by one of the, the Contra Costa County deputies. This is all in the, in the complaint that was just filed uh, today. Um, and Brian uh, was, at, was ordered by the officer to unlock his phone. Uh, and Brian, being well-versed in many of these issues, um, wasn't sure what would happen if he didn't, uh, given that the officer had already drawn his weapon. So he complied with the officer's instruction. He showed him that he had rented the car through this particular app. The officer called. Uh, get around and and was able to determine that he had actually rented it uh, and then eventually after a 20 minute uh, you know episode was was let go and they were sent on their way um, but as you can imagine this was pretty terrifying and Brian is somebody who uh, is well versed in license plate readers is well versed in this area of the law and yet this happened to him uh, as well um, he's now suing the, the the deputies and the agency itself um, uh, for damages so we'll see how that how that case plays out. But, you know, this is something that that uh, uh, continues now, you know, and the reason why he found out later was because the car that he had rented and again, through, through this app, right, this isn't this isn't like renting through Hertz or whatever, where there's like a fleet of cars. This is like a regular person's car, right? It's like the Airbnb of rental cars or whatever. Um, that person had, who I think owned the car uh, somewhere in the Bay Area. Uh, had left it and then somehow the San Jose Police Department had recorded it as stolen when in fact it was not stolen. And so somehow that didn't filter up into the Contra Costa Sheriff's uh, license plate database. And so that's why they pulled him over. Um, uh, you know, and, and that's an amazing story. Uh, and that it happened to Brian Hofer of all people, who's the head of the Privacy Commission, I think is even more incredible. Um, so these issues continue to percolate out. Um, and uh, you know, keep all of you smart people employed. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Great, um, Michelle. Do you want to weigh in before on on the the city question? Sure. Um, I agree with Sasha that I actually found the Oakland um, Privacy Advisory Commission pretty fascinating, since uh, you have such a diverse group. You have law professor. You have a Muslim activist, a police, former police officer. So I think it's a really group that you have. And I thought of a similar group, which is slightly different, but I think City of Portland has a similar group, group called a Smartest Cities Steering Committee. So they started um, in 2017 
but they still meet every month to discuss about, discuss about any concerns or any issues, challenges, how to build trust in using um, having a smart city community. So I, I've heard it, it's been a very good discussion in at City of uh, Portland, um, and I think it's very important to have this kind of communications going on um, to just spot the issues on a daily basis or at a community level. So I totally agree that this effort is very important in driving some of this, the privacy discussions that we are currently having. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I, I didn't know about the Portland uh, uh, example. I would love to know more about that. Um, you know, something I've said to officers who attend the privacy meetings, you know, they've had sessions where they invite, um, you know, high ranking uh, officers, uh, captains, commanders, uh, to the privacy meetings uh, to to speak before the privacy commission, and I've said to to some of them, I've said, look, you know, like a way that you can, you know, I think I think anybody who has ever spent any time in Oakland knows, uh, Oakland is a city that tragically has a lot of very serious crime. We're a city of 400,000 people. Uh, the police is chronically understaffed. Uh, there are something like 80 people who get murdered every year in Oakland on average over the last several years. Um, uh, you know, property crime uh, continues to happen. Other awful crimes continue to happen. And I think most people want the police to do their jobs uh, and to solve particularly violent, serious crime. Um, but at the same time, people, I think, don't like the idea of being, I think, all, you know, many people don't like the idea of being over-policed or being policed in a way that they don't fully understand. Um, especially in a city like Oakland that has had a history of that, right? I think many students of privacy law know uh, the whole history of the Black Panthers, of Cointel Pro, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's, I think, very much on the minds of many people here. Um, but at the same time, I think one thing that not only the, the Oakland Police Department could do, but other police departments could do, uh, and I've said this to them, is, hey, you could have like an open house where you bring your drones and your body cameras and your stingrays and all of your cool toys, and you just kind of invite whether it's journalists or lawmakers or just regular people who are interested in this issue um, to come and touch it and see it and play with it and learn about it and explain it to them and say, hey, this is what we have. This is why we have it. This is what it's for. This is not what it's for. These are the people, these are the human beings that have access to these devices um, as opposed to just kind of a faceless uh, bureaucracy. And I recognize that maybe that's a little bit harder to do in a city like New York City or Washington DC or Chicago or LA, but it's probably doable in a city like Oakland of 400,000 people. And there are lots of communities, I think in America of let's say half a million people or less um, where I think you could actually actually do that. Um, so, uh, you know, if, uh, if that does happen or if there are people who wanna make that happen in your cities, uh, do let me know, cause I would love to, to see that happen. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. I just pulled the uh, Hofer versus, uh, what is this case called? Hofer versus Emily, he's, a, he's the deputy. Um, so you guys can read this later. Uh, this is the complaint that I was talking about. It was just filed here in federal court in Oakland this morning. Gotcha. Su super helpful. So Camilla, uh, please join the conversation. Um, you read the book. I assume you liked the book. If you didn't, I don't know. No. <laughs> what do you think? Absolutely. I love the book and I found it extremely fascinating because um, what you have to imagine is that I am an expert on European Union and European Union comes, has a completely different background, completely different outlook, completely different approach uh, to the US one. And uh, this is also highlighted by Cyrus, uh, you brought in the, in the introduction, page 17, uh, put it, or put it another way, there is no inherent right to privacy in the United States. In the European Union, the uh, the protection of uh, people in relation to the processing of their personal data is a fundamental right brought in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And that is, it, <laughs> I'm sure you can see the difference <laughs> that that um, means and that, that establishes. So when the European Union establishes legislation and adopts legislation uh, like it did with the GDPR, it's uh, it's something that comes from a long path of choices and a long tradition. And I can, in, in there is a, some kind of difference also in the, the approach that we take in um, on of, of a, the human being, I mean, um, compared to uh, 
US and EU in the approach of the UN being to uh, its data and its uh, privacy life. One is knows for, for sure that there is a system that already uh, guarantees its, its privacy and the other one doesn't. So I uh, not only I love the book, but I love everything I'm hearing about the, um, this bottom-up approach to protection of privacy and the protection of the use of data. Learn how your data and your privacy is treated and what is done with it. Having said that, um, yeah, uh, no, we don't. Uh, not that I am aware of. There is, a, there is a huge public discussion at the moment, of course, going on because uh, it, it, I think Cambridge Analytica and the various Max Schramm cases opened a bit the eyes, rather than the eyes opened a bit the, the interests of people in, relate, in relation to this, um, to this topic. Um, but uh, as I said, we come from a long tradition of um, balance between the right to privacy and other kind of rights. And as you wrote, we had the Stasi. So we <laughs> are looking forward to uh, not have this uh, replicated anytime soon. And right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned, I, I think I mentioned briefly in the book that I lived from 2010 to 2012 in Germany. And this was mm -hmm. really kind of what set me down this rabbit hole of, of thinking about privacy in a new way. You know, I arrived in Germany at a time when Google Street View was very, very new. Mm -hmm. um, this was in the spring of 2010 um, in Germany. And you had various, uh, as maybe people remember, uh, various German uh, ministers and uh, members of parliament and other leaders um, largely saying that they were against it and saying that they didn't like Google, uh, you know, doing this um, and, uh, you know, saying that uh, they were very frustrated by what Google was doing. And it was sort of, as an American living in Germany, it was interesting to sort of think about the fact that by and large, it seems to me the kind of default position of most people in Europe uh, and especially Germany is that they are inherently more trusting of the government writ large um, and less trusting, generally speaking, of private companies, right? Um, they, one of the things that I found amazing from kind of a privacy perspective, that one of the very first things I had to do when I arrived in Bonn, Germany, was I had to go to the city hall and present myself and register myself with the city. I had to say, hi, I'm Sarus, here's my passport, here's my you know, visa yeah. or whatever. And I live in this address on this street. Uh, and now you've recorded me officially into your database. Uh, and when I moved apartments uh, a year later across town, uh, I had to do it again. And when I left the country for good, I had to do it again. And, um, you know, and I mentioned this to my German friends and they say, oh yeah, like that's totally normal. Everybody does it, whether you're German, foreign, whatever, we don't care, everybody does it, it's not a big deal. And I thought, wow, like, Imagine if in America we had to do that, right? Imagine if every time you moved houses or apartments or whatever uh, within the same city, from city to city, from state to state, you had to go in person and present yourself um, to the authorities. I think many Americans would feel that that was invasive, um, you know? And yet we as Americans are not bothered by a private company sending, you know, cars with crazy cameras on the top <laughs> down literally every street in this country and taking pictures of them, you know, usually one, two or three times a year in most cases in, in America. Um, Google has, you know, pretty much abandoned Street View in Germany as far as I know. Um, the images have not been updated in years. Um, but here, you know, I, I, I saw one, I saw a Google Street View in Oakland, you know, just the other week, right? They're, they're doing this all the time. Um, and, uh, and so I just kind of find that amazing that these histories of these countries where, you know, baked into the DNA of our own founding documents is this like big fear of the kind of capital G scary government. Um, whereas in Europe uh, and Germany, especially, right, there's, there's less uh, concern about the government getting out of hand and more concern about, you know, companies getting out of hand. And so you have these privacy laws, you have the whole idea of like a data protection agency, I think to an American is like amazing and interesting. <laughs> when I arrived in Germany and people were like, yeah, here, there's this idea of data protection. And not only that, we have a data protection agency for Germany. And not only that, we have a data protection agency for every single German state, right? We have one for Bavaria and we have one for North Rhine-Westphalia where I live. We have one for Berlin and Hamburg and all the other states. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, like, how come we don't have that, right? And so in California, my home state, I, I'm a fourth generation Californian. 
Uh, I've lived here most of my life. Uh, I think California is maybe kind of sort of trying to move in that direction, right? I think many of you know we have the CCPA, right? Um, the California Consumer Privacy Act um, that uh, was written in large part by uh, another Iranian American in Oakland, not me, a guy but that maybe many of you know, uh, Ashkan Soltani, who's a very smart guy on this. He used to be a technologist with the FTC um, and has written at length uh, about many of these issues. Um, he's mentioned in the book. Um, and, you know, I think that California um, is a place where we are trying to, we may not get it, you know, totally right, but, but I think in many ways the, the CCPA is sort of a California's answer to the GDPR. Um, and, you know, I always love to tell people that in the California constitution, I don't think many Californians even realize that we have a constitution, <laughs> but we do, it's very long. Um, uh, in Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution is the affirmative right to privacy, which I mentioned in the book, but I always just love telling people that because it's kind of amazing because that we don't have that, federally speaking, as you all know, uh, right? Um, and I know that there are a handful of other states, I don't know which ones off the top of my head, but there are a handful of other states that also have that. Um, but it sort of amazes me that, that there aren't more states that, that have uh, affirmed that right for, for their own citizens. Um, so I think that this interplay between what America does and what Europe does and maybe what, you know, other countries in the future do, I think is really interesting. Um, and, you know, as I often say on Twitter, you know, isn't federalism fun? Uh, you know, this is the result of, of federalism, right? Is that we have some states that are doing one thing, we have other states that are doing a different thing. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I, if I may, I don't know, I'm just seeing there's a couple of questions here. I don't know if I should address those now or... Can, can I, I, I uh, let's, let's yeah. talk to Sasha in just a second. Let, let me flag um, on the state constitution question. Um, Struis is exactly right. Uh, in a previous life, I actually, uh, you know, filed briefs in a case up in Massachusetts, which is also a state that has an affirmative constitutional right to privacy. And in many circumstances, uh, state Supreme Courts will construe those state constitutional rights to privacy more broadly than the federal Fourth Amendment analysis. So it isn't simply that the right to privacy is affirmatively stated, the boundaries and remedies for that right can often be more expansive than the federal right. Um, and again, isn't federalism grand? That is part of the federal system. Um, states cannot narrow the rights under the federal constitution, but they may expand them. And some of those rights, particularly in Massachusetts, you know, California, a slightly newer state, right? The Massachusetts Constitution actually predated the federal constitution. So in that way, did, didn't just have a federalism stake um, to claim, but a, a precedential and, and kind of pre-existing stake to claim as a colony. Um, so Sasha, really interesting question on this vendor question, uh, playing off of, of, of Sarus's uh, reference to Google Street View and some other uh, commercial data collection techniques. Right. So the, the discussion surrounds these you know, businesses, private companies that have uh, these business models that uh, involve collecting and using and selling data to uh, the government uh, and also creating these surveillance tools that we've heard some about. Um, and the lack of transparency and accountability, I think, is even greater here. Uh, and there's, there's also the additional issue that um, we're dealing not just with the uh, suspect of any particular incident, but, you know, vast amounts of information about individuals. And so, um, from the latest in investigation, so under the case law, I guess, Sarus, my question is, do you think there's any room for Fourth Amendment analysis with respect to um, the, uh, the government of obtaining um, this information from pr private companies? where it's not the government that's doing the collection of the information, but rather uh, the private companies who are doing it and then selling it or pro providing access to uh, companies. Or should it, do you think it should be dealt with separately outside of the Fourth Amendment? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, and this is something that I think myself as a non-lawyer, and I think many people who aren't lawyers don't fully appreciate is this distinction between searches and non-searches, right? What is considered to be a search uh, with a capital S and what is, an, what is not a search? And there are so many things like license plate reader scanning that currently under the law are considered to be not searches, right? That are, that are okay for, for police to do. Um, and I think, you know, when you put, the way I often explain it to people is I think, you know, most of us, 
if you put an officer you know in front of my house right now uh with a notepad uh, and a pencil i think nobody would object to that officer having that technology uh to record his or her observations uh, but then, you know, if you kind of escalate up, right? So you say, okay, well, what if you give them binoculars? What if you give them a camera with a huge telephoto lens? What if you give them infrared scanning capabilities? What if you give them a drone? What if you give, you know, and you just kind of go up. Um, I think for many of us, uh, you know, we don't fully understand where that line is or should be per se. Um, but with respect to uh, treating the use of techniques of obtaining other kinds of information, license plate reader information, for example, or also, uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of new uh, new information that's being obtained from, from other companies. Um, the Carpenter case was all about cell phone records. Um, we've had a little bit of cases starting now um, having to do with, um, uh, you know, for example, uh, data stored by a smart speaker, you know, a, an Alexa type of system. Uh, you, some of you may remember, I think it was a couple years ago, there was a murder case in Arkansas where the police wanted to get um, uh, audio recordings that an Alexa had captured at the scene of a murder. Amazon resisted. Ultimately, that demand, I think, was dropped. The issue, again, is unresolved. Um, there's also the question of, of uh, you know, facial recognition. Um, we now live in a world where, where people's uh, faces are being scanned at airports by private companies, by robots, <laughs> by, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and it seems to me that if you read, if you believe in, or if the court believes in, uh, you know, the reading of the of the Knotts case, um, then we're all screwed as far as facial recognition is concerned. Because it seems to me that legally speaking, scanning your face doesn't seem substantively different than scanning your license plate. I'm hoping that I'm wrong, but it seems like that's what the law is at the moment. Um, and there's a case uh, that is. Um, uh, pending before the Florida Supreme Court that maybe some of you know, uh, it's a case called Willie Lynch versus State of Florida. Uh, it involves a crack cocaine, uh, an alleged crack cocaine dealer um, who went by the name Midnight, um, and he was found, um, he was arrested by uh, some uh, Jacksonville uh, deputies, sheriff's deputies, um, after they took a picture of him with a phone and then ran it through a facial recognition system, and then he came back as the match. And he was, ba I mean, the way that, the way the defense argues in this case, and it's currently, I don't think the, the Florida Supreme Court has granted cert, I don't know if they call it cert in the state court, um, uh, if they've granted you know, approval or cert equivalent um, yet, but uh, he's being represented by ACLU and ACLU Florida. Um, and they're basically saying, look, you know, this is like a one man lineup, right? Like, like he should have the ability to scrutinize uh, this system, this spatial recognition system. And again, this arrest happened years ago. This is something, this is why I think that entities like the Oakland Privacy Commission and other similar entities and similar laws in other jurisdictions are so important is because we can't wait for the court. Like, and this is sort of like, when I first started working this book, my kind of hypothesis was, you know, all these judges, especially the Supreme Court, by and large, they're like older white dudes and they're kind of out of touch and they wouldn't know the difference between a body camera and a stingray. And, uh, you know, and, and we're just all kind of screwed. That was sort of my like nihilistic hypothesis when I started. But when I when I finished this project, I sort of came to the realization that I think some, uh, you know, other lawyers and judges have said previously, which is like, hey, you know, it's not the judges, it's not a judges or a court's job to say what the law is, it's to interpret the law. And if you want the law to change, you got to change it. And so, uh, so we got to do more on the front end, we can't wait the, the five or seven or eight years it takes for cases to get to the Supreme Court. Uh, and just as an aside from just kind of a you know, legal history perspective, I was amazed that it took like two years for Katz, from the time that Katz got arrested to the time that his lawyer was at the Supreme Court. Uh, and Carpenter took something like eight years from the fact of like when he was doing the robberies to the time that his lawyers ended up in the Supreme Court. So we can't, the technology moves too fast, the courts move too slow, we can't wait. So we like really need um, people at the local level, the state level, the county level, tribal level, regional level, um, ideally the federal level, um to help us think through these things um, um so yeah i i uh i really look forward to more thank you and i, I wonder too uh whether G a gdpr like law would at least take care of some of the um the activities of the private companies in terms of at least the initial collection so um that's also something i think um might be helpful in this area uh, if I may jump on this, John, if you don't mind. Um, 
the GDPR, I might surprise you to know that it, um, the GDPR dis did not disrupt Europe the way in which it surprised the rest of the world. And this, as I was mentioning before, is because we have a long tradition, but not only that. Because of the um, approach that companies and membership bodies uh, had towards, the, towards policy, they have a long history of adopting best practices for which when the GDPR arrived, they were like, well, yeah, I mean, yes, it requires a bit more uh, recording of reasons and proceedings, but it doesn't really change things that much uh, versus what we were doing and what we were used to do earlier. And um, on what was just uh, what uh, was just said about um, <laughs> we have the exact same problem. I'm, I'm, I'm talking like we, we were we are aliens versus <laughs> other kind of aliens. But uh, also in Europe, let's say also in Europe, we have a kind of uh, a problem in uh, dealing with uh, uh, let's say keeping up uh, with the with the technology developments but we also have a huge problem in solving new problems with all solutions because we have a generation of politicians a generation of uh, judges or policy makers that do not fully understand what is going on and uh, do not fully understand what's the pace in the development and uh, keep on uh, treating as I said, all problems, uh, uh, sorry, new problems with all solutions. So we're trying to uh, come up with policy, but apparently at the moment policy is no longer even the best, uh, the best mean, the best tool to tackle it. So I'm wondering if what, what about empowering people? Empowering people is huge is huge in many ways and it's huge also in telling them uh in, that, in telling them what 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 their data value what is the value of their privacy and uh, what is the value the, the monetary value of what they're doing and once they get to learn every like or every and they put or every tweet they retweet or every action they take has a cost uh i think that this will lead not to a, I'm not taking I'm not saying that it's just but is a more balanced discussion yeah i think that you know this is part of the reason why for example uh you know mark zuckerberg testified last year about a year ago actually before the uh, u.s senate uh, joint committees uh, two committees like half of the u.s senate um you know just last year um, and, you know, I think that we are now as a society starting to grapple with many of the things that many people who've been steeped in these issues for a long time, uh, whether it's lawyers or technologists or both or, you know, journalists and, uh, and other people, uh, I think are starting to understand this kind of, you know, data for dollars uh, or euros or whatever. <laughs> um, in an entirely new way, you know, like this is kind of revealed in something that my colleague Olivia Solon and I reported on recently at NBC News, and I'll put a link to this in the in the chat in a moment. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't seen, uh, there's currently an ongoing case uh, in a local court here in San Mateo County, not about an hour's drive from where I live here in Oakland, just south of San Francisco, um, involving a tiny startup uh, called 643 uh, that was making this uh, very short-lived uh, and a bit creepy, uh, bikini photo searching Facebook app. Um, and this company was, you know, barely any people downloaded it, they made barely any money, uh, and they essentially ceased to exist when Facebook decided a few years back to change the way that it gave access to uh, its users' friends' data. What they did was they, the, the, uh, what they call the graph API, uh, the version 2.0 was less permissive than the first version, and so this bikini app uh, no longer had access to these bikini photos, which is objectively, I think, a good thing. But also uh, from the company's perspective, um, they said, look, this is, this is not what we were promised. The, you know, you promised us access to all of this data and now we don't have it. And so now we don't have a business model. And this lawsuit um, is still ongoing. There's a hearing, uh, if you find yourself in the area, there's a hearing that I'll be at uh, this coming Friday uh, in, in Redwood City. Um, but, uh, you know, there's this interesting, 
connection between, especially here in, in Silicon Valley, between, you know, competition and privacy and power. Uh, and this, you know, touches into areas of antitrust and, and other areas of the law. Um, and I think that we're just now starting to grapple with that in a meaningful way in this country. Um, and there have many, been many people uh, who have been, uh, you know, really, really pushing that forward. Some of you may have read uh, the paper by a woman named Dina Srinivasan, um, who kind of articulated this uh, much more forcefully and clearly and intelligently than I have just now. But, um, you know, I, I think that through these kinds of issues and cases and companies, uh, we're, we're, you know, I would like to believe, uh, you know, improving our, our, our understanding of those kinds of things. Uh, uh, so yeah, you know, much in the same way that, that, you know, a tiny, you know, like I, like we were saying earlier, with these tiny, you know, criminal situations, now we have this, you know, tiny little startup uh, that is, you know, maybe uh, raising some new questions about uh, how much power these companies have that are built on, you know, this kind of collection of data. It's super interesting. Um, and, and so that gives us a little bit of a hint on what you're thinking about next in terms of what you cover and, and what you write about and what cases you think might be important, right? So maybe this bikini app case is, is something that's interesting enough to write about. Um, let me, um, at the risk of, uh, you know, disturbing or angering Justice Scalia's ghost, um, let me suggest that there is a Fourth Amendment case from the past few days that, that I found interesting. So, um, Sarus and, and, and the other discussants, are you familiar with the case Taylor versus City of Saginaw? Okay, so this is a no, case no. that the Sixth Circuit decided just two days ago. Um, it involves a practice. Oh, wait, is this the chalking tires case? Yeah. <laughs> This case is amazing. Okay, so so we talked at the beginning about how sometimes cases that make it to the federal circuit courts regarding the Fourth Amendment and cases that make it to the Supreme Court regarding the Fourth Amendment are not the cases you would expect. And Taylor versus City of Saginaw involves a practice called chalking, um, specifically chalking tires, and even more specifically, um, local police using small chalk markings on, on the tires of parked cars in order to determine whether those cars are overstaying their welcome, overstaying the regulations in a particular parking zone. Um, now, this is a technique that is typically um, used by municipalities who don't employ automated license plate readers because here in Washington, DC, for example, some of the parking enforcement vehicles have ALPRs um, that they use to determine whether certain cars have stayed in the zone too long. Right, uh, in small towns, uh, police will simply chalk the tire. And um, Allison Taylor, young lady, uh, received a lot of parking tickets. And she challenged this on Fourth Amendment grounds and specifically um, under some of the language in US v. Jones, uh, which is an important case um, that was decided by, um, you know, really uh, split decision in the Supreme Court. Um, there, there was a, there was, an opinion, there were concurrences, there were dissents, um, and there was a very, either there was no clear guidance given or it was very complicated guidance that law professors and other, other experts are still sorting through about the degree to which the physical invasion, the physical trespass of, of a search really matters, right? And in this case, the Sixth Circuit decided that um, the physical act of, of placing chalk on a car tire constituted a search, and it was enough to constitute a search. So, um, Saruz, in, in these kinds of idiosyncratic cases where the facts themselves may be a little wacky, um, how do you approach writing about and, and thinking about these cases where the, the underlying issues are super important, um, but the facts themselves um, aren't the ones you might expect? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was just, I, I had read, uh, and I'm just now scrolling through this, this opinion, which I need to like read more closely. I had, I remembered seeing it earlier, but not realizing fully some of the details of it. And first of all, this case is amazing. Second of all, uh, this case involves, it's worth noting, uh, uh, for those of you who uh, remember these sorts of things, um, a pretty legendary judge, Judge, judge Damon Keith, um, who, by the way, is 96 years old and is a 
is, is a judge that takes senior status. I don't know, for those of you who aren't American lawyers, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, here on the federal bench, and lawyers, correct me if I get this wrong, uh, judges can basically choose to take senior status, which from what I can tell means they don't have a full active caseload, but also it seems like they can just take whatever cases they want. Um, so I don't know if Judge Keith deliberately chose this, if he was just assigned it. I don't know how that works when you're a senior judge or when you're Judge Keith. Um, uh, and Judge Keith gets a, gets a mention in my book for being um, the, the judge in what is often referred to as the Keith case, um, which is this like super convoluted national security case out of Michigan that I won't get into right now. Um, but he kind of pops up a lot in, in some of these privacy issues. And I wonder, I would love to interview Judge Keith. There was a film about Judge Keith um, uh, called, I think it's called like My Walk with Judge Keith that I've been trying to figure out how I can see. Um, uh, it's called Walk With Me, The Trials of, of Damon J. K J. Keith. Um, uh, if you guys can, you know, have any, I've been trying to watch this film. It seems to have not really been dist distributed, but um, anyway, there's a documentary about him. But yeah, I, I agree with you that, um, you know, there are so many instances here where, uh, you know, a, a really small thing can have much larger uh, ramifications. And it seems to me that, um, you know, it's almost kind of comical in a way that, you know, a tiny chalk mark, again, for those of you who've never experienced this, right, these chalk marks are, I don't know, yay big, They're, they can't be more than a couple of inches long. And, you know, I know the court in other cases has, has turned on whether or not, you know, the, the, uh, the function of the, you know, like in the Jones case, for example, right, whether the, the placement of the device interfered with the normal operation of the car. Here, obviously, a, a chalk mark doesn't interfere with the, with the turning of the tires or anything like that. Um, and yet, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that, um, you know, that, that this was a, um, uh, you know, an issue that, that the court considered. And I really want there to be a Supreme Court ruling on this. I really want there to be a circuit split on this so that we can find out once and for all whether or not it's constitutional for um, people to do this. Uh, I also think that this is kind of, I would, I'd, I'd be really curious to know how like street parking works in other countries. Like, is this an issue that's uniquely American because of the weirdness of how we do parking enforcement? And also because the weirdness of that in many places in America, people are like weirdly obsessed with parking. Uh, like it's difficult or it's not difficult or, you know, whatever, right? If we all just used like parking lots and parking apps or whatever, like this wouldn't even be a thing. Um, but again, you know, isn't federalism fun? So, um, so yeah. <laughs> So um, we are reaching the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, Saruz, thank you so much for joining us to talk about your book. It's my pleasure. I really do appreciate your interest. And I always say to people, especially people who work in this area, uh, if you're working on a case, if you hear of a case, if you're inklings of a case uh, that I should know about, uh, I'm really easy to get in touch with. Journalists are, are notorious for being easy to find. Um, uh, I'm all over Twitter. I'm too much on Twitter. Uh, you know, my email address is in my, my Twitter profile, very easy to find. I'll put it here. Um, but yeah, do bring us stories, right? Journalists and lawyers, I think, rely on stories, on narrative, on characters, on conflict, on, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. So, you know, if you're suing the, your local police department over chalk or license plate readers or whatever it is, please tell me because I want to know. Um, and just like if you hear of cool things like we were talking about earlier in Portland or other places, uh, I would love to know that. If any of you are going to be here in the Bay Area for the PLSC, the Privacy Law Scholars Conference, which is coming up soon, uh, I will be here for that. Um, uh, I won't be at IAPP in Washington, unfortunately. Um, but if you are in the Bay Area ever and want to, you know, discuss this over beer or tacos or whatever, uh, feel free to just just say hi. I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for spending time with me, with us. Thank you to John for moderating this. Thank you to the other uh, discussants. That's a term I've never heard before. Um, uh for for uh you know helping to facilitate this conversation um yeah and and this is this is all all really great thank you so much you, you you're very welcome the pleasure was ours um if anybody has access to that movie about judge keith please you know reach out and 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 we can pass that along as well um uh, sasha and camilla thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate it thank you john and thank you michelle and thank you sarah Soft, of course um and finally um for our book club the next book club is Wednesday, June 19th, 2 p.m. Eastern, and we will be reading 
The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. Um, it is an excellent book. Um, I have not quite finished it yet, but it's really good so far. Um, so please join us June 19th at 2 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everybody who helped make the Zoom and the Facebook Live and everything else happen. Thank you. Thanks. All right, leave meeting. I left the meeting. Yeah. Yeah.